In this vast continent of Tevat, we have arrived at a fantasy world where the seven elements flow and converge. With this landmass stretching as far as the eye can see, seven archons preside over the respective nations, sharing with them their different ideals and divine knowledge. As time passed, their people would prosper and grow into large communities that are distinguishable even by an outsider. Due to this, it would soon shape the culture of the people of Tevat. In this video, we will be exploring the type of governments each released nation has, added with some speculations regarding the government types for the upcoming nations such as Simuru, Natlan, Fonsein, and Snezhnaya. As you may all have noticed, there are certain aspects to how each respective nation is being ruled, either by a group of people, a social class, or a sole ruler. So we figured that we'd get a look into this topic and get to know more about Genshin's world building. Now I want to first credit two Reddit users who were a big contribution and inspiration for this video. The first one is the user Masuher for their post that actually gave this video's idea. Well, thanks to Crunchlets for giving us a more in-depth explanation and clarifications. It was a great read. And if you want to check it out for yourself and also support them, the link for it is in the description below. As a disclaimer, these are just assumptions based on our observations from the game and thus can be interpreted differently by others. If you disagree and think we assume the wrong type, that's okay. You can feel free to share your thoughts down below. So, without further ado, let's begin. The setting of Genshin Impact is wildly inspired by cultures from the real world and integrates many of our lifestyles, mythologies, and species into it. To add to that, even the way it is governed also takes some inspiration from reality. Initially, let's take a look into how Tevat works as a whole. Now it can be argued that Tevat as a continent is theocratic, with Celestia governing its base laws which are also known as the Heavenly Principles. As a context, Theocracy is a type of government ruled by either divine guidance or by officials who are regarded as divinely guided. In the case of Genshin Impact, Celestia is seen as the heavens and are called gods, indicating that they possess divine power and knowledge. We can imagine that Tevat is the landmass of Celestia's empire. If we compare it with our own world history, Celestia would be similar to how the Holy Roman Empire worked in old times. We can also equate the Archon War with the Thirty Years' War, while the Archons would be the royals who pay homage and take power from the head of the Empire, which is Celestia. Now as for the seven known nations we are introduced to, the first one we arrive at is Mondstadt. For how Mondstadt's government works, it's quite tricky to distinguish because there are two possible types that were either mashed together or taken some inspiration from. The first one is that it can be similar to the Ordenstadt, which means states of the Teutonic Order, while also having a touch of a theocratic system. For a quick history trivia, an Ordenstadt is ruled by the Teutonic Order, a religious order that was first founded as a military organization during the Third Crusade in 1190 AD. This order's goal was to aid the Christians from the north on their journeys to the Holy Land and to establish infirmaries to help the sick, while also serving as a military order and assisting in battles. Most of its members are German with knowledge of medicine and are said to dress as knights with wings or horns. They follow the motto, help, defend, heal. Now how is this similar to Mondstadt's government? Well, it has a theocratic feel to it, because while the head of the state is the Knights of Avonius, rather than fronting their military, they front the Church of Avonius, which is evidence of the church being located at the highest point of Mondstadt, putting religion as the forefront of the nation. The Church of Avonius acts as the ideological leader and social authority of Mondstadt, while the Knights are its effective acting governments. However, the Knight system is very similar to an Ordenstadt. The highest position in Mondstadt is the Grand Master. This is parallel to a Hulkmeister of the Teutonic Order. The Grand Master of the Knights of Avonius is a singular position that holds limited power. However, it is not a hereditary position and with the spirit of Barbatus's freedom, is most probably acquired by election within the Knights. We would assume that their election system copies a bit of the Teutonic Order's way of electing a Grand Master. The Teutons would conduct a Capitulum, where chapters composed of 12 people would select their major candidate. 
The possible candidates to be the Grand Master are only based on merits and not lineages. So for the possession of Grand Master, a candidate has to have experience and a background of excellence. In the case of the Knights of Favonius, it isn't entirely shown or explained how they choose their Grand Master, but this is just an assumption that they also pick their own candidates and favor the one with the most experience. As an example, we can look at the backgrounds of Arendelin, who was one of the former Grand Masters. If we read his story in the Braveheart Artifact set and the Favonius Greatsword, it is said that while Arendelin came from a line of knights, he still earned his reputation through years of intense training and combat experience. He was said to also not have a vision, so it's safe to assume that he was really admired for his hard work. Another example is the current Grand Master Varga, who is, till to this day, hasn't returned. In Varga's case, we can assume that he was chosen by the majority of the knights and their captains, based on his excellence in leadership or experience in combat. This is proven with Child, calling him the Titan of the Knights of Avonius, Jean telling us that he is a legend of his generation, and Eula sharing with us that he was purposely holding back while sparring with her. With all of these points noted, it is quite interesting that maybe Hoyoverse was directly referring to the Teutonic Order when they thought of creating the Knights of Avonius and referenced the idea Ordenstadt into the city. If we take a look at the Hawkmeister's coat of arms, this is very similar to the symbols on the entrance of the Knights' headquarters. Now moving on to the second possible type of Mondstadt's government, it could also qualify as a constitutional monarchy. What is a monarchy? A monarchy is a type of government where an individual ruler functions as the head of state, but their power varies from different forms like constitutional monarchy or absolute monarchy. An example of a constitutional monarchy is how the United Kingdom is governed. Now if you look at Mondstadt's system, it can qualify as a monarchy because while the Grand Master is the head of state, the ability to make and pass legislation resides with the Council of the Captains and the Seneschal. The Grand Master does not hold absolute power, as the Captains and the Seneschal are counsels to the Grand Master regarding policies and enforcement, as noted from the Genshin Impact manga. To add as a side note, before the establishment of the Knights of Avonius, Mondstadt was under an absolute monarchy, with the Lawrence clan holding absolute power, and the succession of this power was passed among their family members. However, take note that this was only during the late period, meaning the Lawrence clan weren't all bad, as its earliest members were kind and noble, and were regarded as one of Mondstadt's ruling classes. The others are the Immunlocker clan and Gunhilder clan. The next city we visit in our travels is Liwe Harbor. Needless to say, Liwe is run under a capitalist oligarchy. How is it a capitalist oligarchy? It's because the head of Liwe State is the Chising. It is a committee made up of seven merchants and leaders who are the best and the richest businessmen of Liwe, regardless of origin and bloodline. Most of Liwe's politics and government branches are held by these seven powerful people and so results in an oligarchy. If you relate this with the real world, Liwe Harbor is like Venice mixed with an angle of Chinese Confucian ministry beliefs and culture. So instead of a Chinese emperor, Replace it with Venetian doges and powerful noble families, and we have Liwe's government. To add to that, the Qixing creates the laws and economic direction of Liwe. If the Knights of Favonius fronts the religion, then the Qixing fronts business and economy. The Qixing is the unchallenged entity of Liwe. It holds the sovereign powers of policymaking and military, which is a part of the inherent right of a state, self-defense. This is evidence of Ningguang and Kuching, both members of the Qixing, having the authority of commanding the Millilith guards. It is also a capitalist because of how the Qixing controls the eight commerce sectors of Liwe, which is called the Eight Trades. How is it a capitalist? Capitalism is an economic system in which private individuals or businesses own capital goods. So the Liwe Qixing having members specializing within the commerce and trade sectors means they value the promotion of the private sector. However, when Morax was still around, the Chising's power was limited by the contract with Morax. After the Ark Quests, it is safe to say that the rule of the Chising has now become unchallenged even by the Adepti by virtue of the new contract. Looking into each member of the Liwe Chising, Ningguang started out as a fish merchant, but earned her wealth through hard work and dedication. From her character story, it seems that she would catch every opportunity she has to gain a sum of Mora. She even considered selling her vision until it started to glow in front of her. 
Now that she is a Tianchuan, her responsibilities grow and focus on the political laws of Liwei. As for Keqing, she came from a rich family in Liwei and inherited a strong sense of responsibility and tenacity from her grandfather. Her skeptical personality carried over when she first became a member of the Qixing and began her work as the Yuhong. Her responsibility is managing Liwei's infrastructure projects and focuses more on long-term profits. Now, the remaining member we know of is Uncle Tian from Ganyu's Story Quest. He serves as the Tianshu of the Qixing, and his responsibility could focus on the security and defense affairs of Liwei, as evident from his secretive identity and his familiarity with many members of the Millilith. There is also one former member of the Qixing I want to add, who is one of Yun Jin's ancestors. His name is Yun Hui, and was the one who designed the prototype weapons. It is possible that because of his brilliance with the art of forging, he gained enough wealth to become parts of the Liwei Qixing. For this third one, we venture on to the island nation of Inazuma. To point the obvious, Inazuma's government is actually a military dictatorship. The Sokoku decree in game is inspired by the Sokoku Edict, which closed the doors of Japan's four nations during the 1600s. There's not much to say since the system of the Shogunate, both in our world and in Inazuma, is definitely a military dictatorship. However, I would like to add that it also takes in elements of Japan during its days as an empire. Because the Shogun is also the Emperor, a divine theocratic ruler who is being worshipped as not just a god, but the supreme god in the land. A and Makoto's rule is founded not on faith, but on military force as noted with the Musono Hitotachi and knowledge on the art of sword and polearm combat. There are also the tri-commissions which exist to support the Shogunate. The Shogun's executive arm is the Tenryo Commission, which manages the security and military affairs of Inazuma. The Kanjo Commission serves as the financial arm of the Shogun and manages the commercial and business affairs. Lastly is the Yashiro Commission, which is the cultural representative of Inazuma and is said to be the closest with the Shogun. They manage the ceremonies and public festivals of Inazuma and also take care of the different shrines and temples. These commissions are kind of similar to what the real Japan had in the past, complete with specific noble families around a principal clan mostly controlling each commission. This is evident with the Kuja clan controlling the Tenryo commission, the Kamisato clan with the Yashiro commission, and the Hiragi clan with the Kanjo commission. However, one thing that is lacking in Inazuma is the number of local daimyo rulers. It might be possible that Hoyaverse did not add this to scale down the world of Tevat for the convenience of the players. Going back to the Shogunate, its focus is security and military. It is a military dictatorship because the focus of the executive arm of the Shogun is military prowess. The policies of the state are enforced with military rule. It is a dictatorship because the power of the legitimate government held by the Shogun is unchallenged and absolute. Any minute refusal to be subject to the power of the head of the state is considered an insurgence and a threat to the safety and security of the nation. Now you might ask, how about the Grand Narukami Shrine's role in Inazuma? It seems that even if religion is a big part of Inazuma, it is not the focus of the Shogun. All in all, Inazuma's government is almost the same as the Japanese Shogunate back in the past. For this fourth one, we move on to the west of Narukami, which is Watatsumi Island. While it is a part of Inazuma's influence, the people living in Watatsumi seem to have a different set of cultures. It is due to the fact that it was descended from the beliefs of Enkonomiya, which we now all know have Greek references. Now, Watatsumi Island can be considered as an autonomous region. What is an autonomous region? This is an area of a country that has a degree of autonomy, or in simpler terms, has freedom from an external authority. Watatsumi would be alluding to Okinawa, which is part of a much bigger archipelago called the Ryukyu Islands. The reason why is that Okinawans have their own cultural history and have an ethnic group unique from those in mainland Japan. This is very similar to Watatsumi, which also has a different set of ethnicity and culture from those in Narukami Island. Going back to their government, it is safe to say that Watatsumi is under a theocratic absolute monarchy. Why absolute monarchy? Well, the head of Watatsumi is the Divine Priestess, a title passed down for the members of the Sangonomiya family. As we can see with how detailed Kokomi is with how affairs should be handled, and how strictly by the book her constituents handle said affairs, 
She has absolute authority and no legal limitations on her power to govern with Tatsumi. It is also because Kokomi inherited her title of Divine Priestess, along with the absolute power to govern her people. It is also theocratic because the main responsibility of the Divine Priestess is to preserve the will of the serpent god Orobashi. The people of Watatsumi strongly believe that to honor this will is to not subject themselves to the rule of the Shogun's military dictatorship, hence why they have their own religious shrines scattered on the island. As for the rest, this is quite tricky to predict because we only have little info about the background of the other nations. We only base them on their original Arkans' beliefs written on each gemstone and some NPCs who are from these places. We also considered the culture that these future nations will reference. For Sumeru, we know that this nation values knowledge and is regarded as the center of learning in Savat. It is also where the Sumeru Academia is located, in which students study arcane arts and keep many historical records. Their current archon is dubbed as the God of Wisdom, and its landscapes are described to be filled with rainforests and deserts. Now in Sumeru, knowledge is considered a resource, and its scholars are extremely desperate to graduate for unknown reasons. These scholars have ranks, and strangely out of the three mentioned so far, the Herbad is the highest rank, followed by Dastur, then Aramati. Herbad scholars seem to enjoy the privilege of having their names attached to their inventions, implying they have made it and given national recognition. However, in real life, it is the inverse. Herbad is instead a minor priest, Whereas a Dastur is a high priest or priestess in Zoroastrianism, Aramati is a word in Sanskrit with five meanings, including not resting, active, going everywhere, devotion, and obedience to God. Now from these points, Sumeru's possible type of governments could be another monarchy, with its priestly class having the authority and serve as the advisory body of the ruling class, or it can also have inspirations based on the caste system. Now what is the caste system? From what we've seen and heard, Simaru can be rooted heavily in Vedic India and Zoroastrianism that could also take inspiration from ancient Persia and Mesopotamia. A caste system is a class structure that is determined by birth, which means the opportunities you have access to depend on the family you happen to be born into. So if you were born a slave, then you are considered a slave until your death. In India, the social classes are divided into five categories such as the Brahmins, who are the priests and the academic class, Kshatriyas who are the soldiers, administrators, and kings, the Vaishyas who are the farmers, merchants, artisans, the Shudras who are the manual laborers, and lastly the Dalits who are also called the untouchables and are seen as the lowest of the low. In the case of Genshin Impact, the Brahmins could be the sages that Yaimiku mentioned at the end of Inazuma's Arkan Quest. These sages in Sumeru could have dominance over the other classes. Yaimiku also tells us that these sages have influence over Kusalani too, so that could be a major reveal of Sumeru's ruling government. We also have a voice line from Sumida telling us of a military force known as Sumeru's Gilded Brigade. This could parallel the next class in the caste system, which are the Kshatriyas. While it isn't much proof, it would be interesting if there would be a possible caste system existing in Sumeru. Sumeru can also have a geniocratic oligarchy type of government because Sumeru may have rulers that are only selected from how smart they are or how knowledgeable with histories and lessons. With the current Dendro Arkans ideology of regarding knowledge as a high form of power, we might see some shades of a secret society style circles of initiation mechanism where each layer of power knows key secrets the lower classes are denied. Now for the nation of Nathlan, it is still quite unknown what culture it will reference. Nathlan could be based on the ideologies of the ancient Aztecs or Mayans, added with some Mexican cultural references. Judging from the title of the current Archon as the God of War, we could expect a tribal imperial angle with how much of their society is tribal and the national center being a Bronze Age style empire like the Aztec Empire. Because of how they value a sense of fighting and warring, we could see smaller tribes or city-states paying tribute to a central government, all underpinned by a religious and societal norm system founded on martial principles and ritualistic violent competition. It is possible that while the current Pyro Archon could be the supreme leader, she could have a supreme judge and administrator by her side, similar to the political structure of the Aztecs. As far as we know, there will definitely be more important roles played by some priests and they might double as war leaders. 
As for who gets to be those war leaders, the rule of champions is recognized by the upholders of tradition, ruled by the strong, underpinned by tradition. So to conclude, Notland could have an Aztec type of government, or an elective craterocracy, which is the rule of the strongest, by virtue of their violent rituals and competition. We also know that boxing exists as a form of martial art in Notland, so we could also expect some type of boxing matches there. Continuing on to the nation of Honsein, the land of the Hydro Archon. Their current Archon is known as the God of Justice, and judging from the descriptions of the NPCs we met, Fonsein prides itself as the hub of culture and the arts. They also have a court of beautiful maidens known as the Court of Fonsein. The wielder of the stringless weapon, known only as the Sojourner, was once a member of the Court of Fonsein before going to Mondstadt. The Court of Fonsein also has a newspaper called the Steambird, which contains different news and info all over Tevat. It is where the camera was invented, and is also where rock and roll music originated from. From this, it seems that Fonsein has a modern feel to it. It is also said to have flying ships that could be blimps, and an air rail that allows citizens to travel along the sky. If we consider this, Fontaine seems to be based on the Industrial Revolution of France with some steampunk elements, but as for their type of government, it could either be a republic or a constitutional criarchy. From Yanfei's voice lines, she mentions that Fontaine has a very complicated legal system. This could be an indication of how modern Fontaine's government is, and could also take some inspiration from the French parliament. As for constitutional criarchy, it is the rule of judges as upheld by written law. With the God of Justice angle, a rule by court is the most likely thing that Fonsein is governed with, the Hydroarchan being the supreme judge, and other courts creating and or curating the legal system, and taking over the legislative side, with the executive subordinated to them. Too much is uncertain before them, except for legalism and law being pushed as the foundation of things. Now on to the final nation. This is probably the hardest nation to figure out, because we aren't really sure how the Fatsui organization works. To add to that, it seems that their members have diehard devotion to the Tsaritsa, which adds a perspective of how the people there are governed. Looking into more of their background, Venti said to us that Snezhnaya and the Fatsui have the most advanced military force in all of the seven nations because of how they are able to utilize elemental attacks and can mass produce these technologies. Looking into the description of their drops, the agent's sacrificial knife is said to be made from superior Snezhnayan technology. We can also see their technological prowess with how the Futsui skirmishers have battle suits that use guns and cannons. Compare that with the other nation's armies, which use the more traditional and medieval style of fighting. The main headquarters of the Adventurers Guild is also located in Snezhnaya, and the Catherines we talked to are also made from their technology. From those who don't know, Catherine seems to be like an android, which is why all Catherines look alike, and has a key-shaped hole at the back of their heads. Okay, so with all of this said, what is the type of government that Snezhnaya could have? It is assumed that it could be based on how Sarist Russia worked, but with a different socio-economic structure and a more advanced army. What is Sarist Russia? It is also referred to as Imperial Russia, and it existed during the 18th century. This type of government is ruled by a Tsar, who holds power as an absolute monarch, subject to only two limitations on his authority. However, Snezhnaya is not entirely similar to Tsarist Russia, because its socio-economic structure is different. Remember how Pantalone, a Fatsui harbinger, controls the nation's economic policies as well as managing the Northland Bank. This is how it differs from a totally Tsarist Russia type of government. Now, if we disregard all of that, we can just imagine Snezhnaya having an evil empire stereotype rather than an actual type of government. It is unknown when or how Hoyoverse will shine some light on how Snezhnaya actually functions. We could assume that the Fatsui also has a huge influence on the nation's welfare, so there's that to consider. While it isn't much that would add to the plot of Genshin Impact, it'll still add to Tevat's world building. Now this ends my video about the type of governments each nation has. What do you think of these predictions? If you have some more to add or correct, you can type them in the comments. If you want, you can support our channel by checking out our Patreon page. It isn't necessary, but it'll be greatly appreciated. Thank you very much for watching, and if you think it deserves one, give this video a like, and hit that bell to be notified for more videos. Once again, we are Clementsheim, and as usual, until the next one, be safe and stay tuned.